Kimberly here. This is Macabish. Cults, classics, and horrors. We're talking films, series, books, and life. We're starting right now. Well, welcome, Christine Chen. We found out about your movie because Chris got it first back in June. Oh, okay. And then he yeah, posted, like and then I had to have it, <laughs> and then I had to watch it, and then he was like, you know, we should have her on the podcast. <laughs> and because That's I'm awesome. slow, it's only just now happening. I'm sorry. It's okay. I'm excited that somebody watched my film. <laughs> <laughs> You're only the third woman and second woman director we've had here, sadly, but I'm glad it's happening because mm-hmm. we really liked your movie. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah, it's it's always like throwing spaghetti at a wall. You hope that people like it. You like it in posts and you're like, well, let's see if it'll breathe. People will like it. And so it's it's always nice to hear that other people did enjoy it. So, yeah. OK, just like all the other directors we have here, we want to hear the whole story. Sure. How did you when did you decide you wanted to make movies for a living? Um, well, I have always been involved with something creative movie wise. It's funny because I look back and I connect the dots of my life and I'm like, oh, I actually was interested in movies starting from when I was in elementary school. But I really didn't know that it could be a job until I took a job after undergrad that I was a real job and I hated it a lot. No. And <laughs> and then I've um, many things happen and I ended up on a set as a production assistant and something like a light bulb went off in my head. And I I said, I don't know anybody who's in film and nobody in my family is going to want me to do this, but I just know that I'm supposed to make movies. So uh, it's, which is really weird because at that point I had only made documentary films. Uh, I took uh, my first like real class that I took was in undergrad because it was a fulfilling an art credit. Okay. And uh, I just knew that I loved it because the proportion of time that I spent on that class was like 70% for one class and then 30% for the rest of my 12 classes or whatever, <laughs> how many classes I had. So I always enjoyed it. And I credit a lot of how my style and why I've been prolific because of my documentary background. Because when you're a documentary filmmaker, you have to shoot yourself, you have to edit yourself. And because of that, I've been able to finish things because I edit, um, I edit all my films basically. So, but yeah, I was getting on a set and having some weird, you know, come to Jesus moment. And uh, I decided that that was what I was going to do, but I had to, figure out how to do it without telling my parents so that was the fun part uh and i i look back i'm like man that was a genius how did i come up with this idea i uh uh, more conniving if if you want to say (laughs) Uh, i realized that oh uh if i want to do films i might need a production company and a company means i need to have some business skills Therefore, I know my parents were totally cool if I went and got my MBA and got Ah, my business degree. mm. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. But I strategically apply to only schools that had film schools attached to them. Uh, Smart. So I know. I'm like, how the hell did I think (laughs) to do that? I don't know. Also, am I allowed to cuss? Because I tend to do that a lot. Yeah, that's fine. (laughs) Okay, cool. Just wanted to make sure. Uh, And anyways... So UT was one of the schools that uh, I applied to because RTF is a really good film school and uh, McCombs is a really good business school. I also had gotten into NYU and stuff, but it was way too expensive and I would be broke for life. So I ended up at UT and uh, did business school and I did well, uh, but on the side, I was hustling as a filmmaker. So uh, I volunteer to produce a lot of student films because nobody who's in film school wants to produce ever because it's not sexy it's not on set Mm. everybody wants to be a director or dp or something like that so i got lots of jobs just producing and i was pretty good at it because most 
not to generalize, but a lot of film students don't have business sense whatsoever. So, so it was great. So that's how I got plugged into the film community in Austin, Texas. And it's, that's always been how I've done things. Just said yes to stuff and then figured it out later. And uh, just, yeah. Too. Yeah. So it just jumps from set to set to set. And, uh, then suddenly I made a movie. <laughs> That's amazing. So, what was your very first one? Uh, my first, so I made some other shorts that were not successful that I never saw the light of day. I feel mm-hmm. like every filmmaker has some of those in the, in the back in the closet. And so I had actually made a short and I tried to make a series, uh, in 2008, but never finished it. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it was because I had let somebody else control post And it was on a system that I wasn't familiar with. So Avid, and I didn't have Avid. So when he started to get real jobs and stuff, it kind of like just disappeared basically. And then the drive crashed and then it was like, well, I guess that's it. So so basically from then on, I was like, I am going to control post because post is where films go to die. And so yeah, so after that, the first short that I would say that I have did that was finished and submitted to film festivals and all that stuff was in 2013 called A Bird's Nest. It's a thriller uh, short film. It, you can find it on Amazon and stuff, but mm-hmm. it's quite dark. Um, I didn't realize how dark it was until going through film festivals. People were like, what was, what the fuck is wrong with you? I'm like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I didn't think it was that bad, but it's a, uh, it's the making of a serial killer, but I have to check that out. Yeah. So, uh, so the kids was that dark aspect, I suppose. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I, I did that. And uh, what, what was funny was when I first screened that, at places people were I guess they were I don't I guess they were looking for like a dude or like just not some not someone like me and so Mm -hmm. they were surprised when I I was the director and I would get a lot of people like talking to my um my lead actor and assuming that he was the director and everything Mm. that so I thought that was really funny um but yeah so that was my first short and I did it uh in Louisiana I found a, there's a competition for those who are, it's still going on. It's called the Louisiana Film Prize. Uh, It's in Shreveport, Louisiana. It's the largest cash prize for a short film festival, uh, short film, Uh, 50 grand. is. Yeah, it's huge. The problem is you have to do your film in Shreveport, Louisiana. And that's the part that like, you know, uh, trips up a lot of people. Uh, I had, I had, I had no problem. So it actually helped me develop and become a better producer because when you are shooting off site, you have to account for everything because who knows what you have access to at that location. So I became really good at just producing and um, prepping and everything because of having sh- shot all my first shorts basically off site. Cause I was still living in Austin, Texas, but I would go every year to Shreveport, Louisiana to, to make films. And that's kind of, it's really weird because all that led to me eventually moving to Shreveport, Louisiana for a year so that I could make Ursley. And that's where it was shot. It was, it was not shot in Shreveport, but it was shot in Louisiana. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. So a lot of roundabouts and then somehow they all connect together, which is weird. Yeah. (laughs) So, well, I was just curious. All those uh, shorts that you have on your uh, on your credits, um, mm-hmm. like, are all those Shreveport uh, shot ones? A lot of them are. I think oh, there wow. might be two that were done in Austin. Uh, uh, there are a lot. The stuff that I directed, all of the all but like two, I believe, are in Shreveport. So the two that were not that are in Austin more, I believe six words was in Austin and then uh, Earth Below. So the, those two were Austin based. Everything else was done in Shreveport, Louisiana. So okay. um, yeah, because I'm a big person on um, kill two birds with one stone. Mm-hmm. And so I think competitions are great because it forces you to have that like timeline. It makes forces you to finished something 
And mm-hmm. then why not possibly win 50 grand? Right. Like, right. Yeah, exactly. So, so that's why I'm driven by, by validation in that way. So I was like, you know what, fuck it. I'm just going to make a shit ton of films in a straight porn and see what happens. And I got in close here and there. And, and, the, and the, I think the biggest thing was I, I started building a pretty great community that I still am very connected to in Louisiana. And uh, that's why I worked a lot in Louisiana uh, that, that weren't my, my films per se. I, I worked on other people's films and AD'd and, and all that stuff. So, and you know, yeah. Carlos, he is a fledgling filmmaker. He said the same thing on set. I think it was his second short. Yeah. He felt the same way you did. Like he just knew. Like a come to Jesus moment. Doing. It was so weird. Like I would go back and I'm like, what the hell compelled me to think that? Because I had zero, I have zero connections. Like nobody in my family, no friends or whatever have done film. And Mm -hmm. I didn't have experience in narrative film. At that point, I just was just a, honestly, just a YouTube filmmaker, you know, have a camera and just shoot things and then edit it together. That's like it, you know, that's my experience with film. And so that set that I was on, which was a 48 hour film set was the first time I'd ever seen a focus puller or I'd ever seen a big ass crew like that. And I was just fascinated. And I don't, I really have no clue what it was that said, like, this is what you're meant to do. Because like, now that I'm a adult, I look back, I'm like, man, I was an idiot. (laughs) (laughs) I had no plans. Like I had no backup plan. No, anything. I was like, this is it. This is, this is it. I'm like, okay. You know, I, I can imagine like a parent hearing their kid being like, I'm going to be a filmmaker with like zero, like experience, zero, any connection experience being like, no, you're not, you know? Right. So yeah, <laughs> so, yeah but I, I, I eased my parents into it. So uh, by good. the time that I graduated from business school, uh, I was already f- had my, my production company was already two years in the making and doing pretty well. And, and I was like, um, I had, you know, I, it, I went to the extent of interviewing, like I interviewed for like corporate jobs and everything, got some and, and just so my parents would just get off my back about it. And then <laughs> and I graduated, I was like, surprise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Those jobs>. yeah. <laughs> Going to live in my friend's dining room and do production. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So. That sounds kind of awesome though. <laughs> but, but I guess because it worked out right. If yeah. it didn't, then well, I right, guess. right. But I, but I think looking back, the biggest thing was I always had. I, it's not like I had no skills, right? So I knew that if my backup plan is probably some people's like first plan, right? My backup plan was, oh, I'll just take a, I'll just take a six figure job at corporate, like no big deal, like. <laughs> <laughs> I did well at business school so it's like yeah that's my backup plan so um so uh, knowing that and that's and I it's funny because when you're in it you don't feel that way I had to have my um really good friend that I basically lived in her no joke I lived in her I guess the dining room is what it was mm-hmm. um so people would think go into the apartment and think that she had a studio because my bed would be in the dining room, but there was a whole other room. Um, but we didn't have a dining room table. It was just my bed there. So, um, but she was like, Hey, you know, if all else fails, you have friends, you can like crash on our couch. You're already living in my dining room anyway, you know, like try it. And who, what's the worst that could happen? And, and she was right. And I'm glad that she told me that because I was, I mean, I was scared shitless doing all this, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, it's different when here's something I would suggest to people out there. If you are in school, start your company while you're in school because you're on student loans. So you don't have to worry about like, how am I going to pay for food? Because student loans are going to pay for them. So it's nice. Get your company running so that by the time you graduate, then you can figure out how the hell am I going to pay for food? Uh, with right. what little money I'm bringing in from my fledgling production company. So, yeah. But, That's uh, smart. Yeah. Is that, I, I don't know. I I look back, I'm like, how the hell did I know that? But <laughs> <laughs> it's worked out. <laughs> well, the, but the best filmmakers have stories like that. And those stories are the best stories. And those filmmakers make the best movies. 
I think so. I think the biggest thing for me having, I, I work as a, when I'm not directing, I, I'm an assistant director. And when I've seen the best directors are the ones that earned their way as a director. And the reason is that they like, there is a less of an entitlement. They understand why all the positions are important and how hard it was to get to where they are. I've AD directors that obviously became directors because they had a friend that was rich or something. And then like, Hey, you want to be a director? Sure. And they just don't get it. They don't get, you know, they don't respect people's positions. They don't respect the time it takes to sure do a set deck that looks like there isn't a set deck, but that's the point. A good, good set decoration looks like there isn't set decoration. You know, I had a, I had a director once that said, Oh, you know, it's like the makeup should be fine because it should look like they didn't they're not wearing makeup. And I'm like, that's skill. That's a certain <laughs> skill to make it look that way, you right. idiot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh yeah, I don't need to pick the clothing or the wardrobe because like it's supposed to just look like everyday clothing. Right. That's a style. Look right. every day's clothing. That is a decision, you mm-hmm. know? So right. but I don't know. I I uh having been an AD, I think that's the b- thing is I see what not to do. So much of that. Yeah. So right. lots of stories there. <laughs> what made you want to make Uzuli? Yes. Uh, it's all good. Um, don't worry, I used to pronounce my film incorrectly too. So <laughs> I used to say Ur- Urzuli as well, because that's what it looks like, but um it's Ursley, actually. Ursley. Yeah. All right. So Ursley is and the reason why I know is that it's because it's actually based off of a um, real, like, Loa, a, a, a Haitian voodoo goddess. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I say based off of, it's very loosely inspired by it. So it's not a, it's, it's not a biography about her. It's just, there's some similarities to her. So, um, okay. and it started off, it wasn't. Ursley was actually not the film I was supposed to make during the pandemic. I had a completely one completely different kind of film prior to the pandemic hitting that I was, you know, on track to make. It's what I would coin the term an Oscar bait film. So a film that you try to use to get into Sundance and and all those kinds of festivals. Uh, Dark, um, PTSD, you know, first responder, that type. And then the pandemic hit and I was like, well, nobody's going to want to watch this film. And uh, there's no way I'm going to be able to get to film inside a hospital and stuff. Like it's going to be a pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. So I, through the grapevine, uh, somebody had mentioned that they were connected to uh, Gravitas and that they were basically curating content for them. That was in the genre aspect. And if I happen to have anything that was genre, horror, thriller, that type of stuff that they would base off of the work that they've seen, I've, me do before they would give me a promise of distribution and yeah so being an opportunist uh, opportunist is that yes i was like oh of course i have a script that is (laughs) perfect (laughs) hold up yeah and i was like thinking back like what the fuck do i have because because and i actually pulled out a short that i had written about nine pages of uh, full on short nine pages that I wrote the summer pro, uh, the summer prior. So like at the start of the pandemic. And so the inspiration for the short was not riveting at all. It was me and my production designer, who is the production design, one of the production designers for Ursley. Her name is Kelly. Uh, we were in a pool and we might have had one too many drinks. And uh <laughs> I was like, man, I love mermaids. And she was like, me too. And I said, I would love to do a mermaid film. She's like, me too. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to write one. That's pretty much it. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. And so I had a specific, I had specific images in mind. When I write, oftentimes that's what happens. I'll have like a very clear image, single image of something. And the image I had was of um, a mermaid eating a man's heart in a bathtub. And which was weird. Um, so that's the only image I had in my head. It Ursley was was actually intended to be a lot darker than it ended up. Uh, I leaned into the comedy, but uh, so I had that single image, and I knew that uh, at that point I was 
growing up, I was really inspired by like Steven Spielberg and all the 90s fun, like group friends going and being up to no good and discovering things and shenanigans. And so I have wanted to write something like that, but for women, uh, because there really isn't something like that really for women, except maybe like Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants or whatever that film's name is, Sex in the City, but nothing like creature related that right. I can think off the top of my head. And so I was like, I really want to write something that's like creature related for women of my age, not like teeny boppers and stuff. Right. Um, and just show, show that. So the, the, the structure of the short is, uh, is actually very similar to how the feature turned out Four women get together, um, except they were in a motel and they run into a mystery lady who ends up being a killer mermaid. And that's kind of the, the premise really. And I pulled this out and I'm like, okay, I'm pretty sure I can t- change this into a feature, basically. And that's part of the reason why I shelved the short. Uh, when I wrote it, I had applied to a bunch of uh, like scholarship, fellowship things, because I knew that if you make a mermaid film, it's going to cost a lot of money, regardless of whether it's a short or a feature. And I didn't get in. I was like, there's no way I wouldn't afford like a, thir- like a $5,000 tail. Like it was just not, not possible. And so, cause like all my, all my shorts at that point had cost, each of them had cost less than $5,000 basically. Mm. So um, I pulled it out. And I'm like, all right, let's make this into a feature. And so I got my really good friend, Camille um, Gladney, who I met through Shreveport, Louisiana, and didn't know actually that she was a huge mermaid kind of sort like huge mermaid uh fan and we co-wrote it and uh and we ha- we did it real fast because you know I've had the script forever right because I have to I had to pitch this so um that's why you know I told them yeah I totally have a script it'll be ready you know before the end of the year and all of a sudden we're, we, we've been writing it you know no I had a short that's all I had um <laughs> so at this point, Camille and I had already been writing, but we were kind of given up on like, oh, you know, let's just write a elevated Hallmark Christmas film and just get that like made so we can sell it and we can like make money and make things that we actually want. So that's what we were in the middle of writing. I was like, Camille, let's let's put the other thing aside. This is what we're making. And we have one month to write it. Oh, <laughs> And she's like, what the fuck? And I was like, <laughs> yeah. I was like, don't worry. This is going to change our lives. Like, let's just do it. And she's like, okay, well, I like mermaids. So fine. And so we gave ourselves a month. And at the end of this December, I guess it's 2020. Yeah. We had a full on feature script and uh, they, I don't know if they really read it. I think they just loved the concept and they're like, yeah, we like it go ahead and make it. And we're like, oh shit, we're going to make this film now. (laughs) And so um, I'm really stubborn. And uh, when I set my mind to something usually happens. And so I'm like, all right, we're going to make this film. And so um, I luckily, because of my background, having had the production company plus 18, I've been collecting people for a very long time. I kind of like making my dream team, you know? all the time, subbing out people, putting in people and all that stuff. So I kind of already knew who I wanted on my team. And they, if you've worked in the industry a lot, you, you accumulate um, points, points, favorite points. (laughs) So I'd gotten many jobs for a lot of these people and, and uh, they knew that, you know, I finished stuff. So I started to reach out to people in January before I had any funding at all. And I was like, Hey, I'm going to shoot this film. We're going to shoot it in April. Um, I said April because April is uh, nice and springy and it would give me uh, at least because they wanted, they wanted a product by they were, they wanted me to aim for the fall, basically have everything done by the fall. And so I was like, well, that should give me enough time, two months of like post and then like back and forth. So yeah, that should, put me having a finished movie by October. Um, and so I went 
balls to the wall and started to collect team. And then um, at that point, one of the investors that was already going to come on for my other film, I was able to convince her to come just jump over to this film. But so I was like, yeah, we're all set. We're good. Uh, February, life happened. And uh, she had to pull out, not because of the film reason, but because of personal issues. And I had no money. So I was like, well, shit. Um, We are shooting this in April. I've told everybody they've locked in these dates. And having been on the other side, I know how bad it is to like keep pushing your dates or to like cancel. If you do that to people once, they're not going to trust you again because right. that that that's a job. If they haven't been able to book, if they've been trying to book stuff and let's say they've foregone a job because they thought they were going to work on yours, like you really have royally fucked them, you know? Right. So, cause I've been in that seat so many times and I know how that feels. Um, and so I'm like, I gotta, I gotta figure out how to make this work. So I went back to my business school buddies and went back to sales 101. Um, I, a long time ago in high school, I sold cut cone eyes. So anyway, uh, what you learn as a salesperson is that you can only control certain things. And what you can control is the number of people you see. You can't control how they're going to react, what they're going to do, predict how much they're going to make. To, to buy from you. But what you can control is how many people you see. And I just kept remembering that. And I, so that's what I did. I, I uh, just scheduled a shit ton of pitch meetings, a crap ton. And I would basically lure my friends in by saying, Hey, I mean, it was true too, but you know, the bigger picture was, like, I hope they would invest, but but I would leer them in by saying that I needed help with my pitch and that uh, if they could give me their opinion as to how to make my pitch better, that would be great. And it would only take an hour of their time. And as long as I could get them to say yes, then, I, you know, cool. So I leered a bunch of people in for just like business school friends and stuff. And I had no expectations. It was just like, this is good. I'm going to practice. And then maybe they will know people that they can recommend me. And I think, there was a day when I had like eight pitch meetings, like and it's a lot. That's, that's a full day. Yeah. So it was like mm-hmm. eight to 8 PM basically um, just pitching and uh, nobody said yes. And mm-hmm. my producer that I pulled in at that point, cause I knew that once I started directing, I, there was no effing way that I could do all the, all the hats. And she was like, Hey, we need to be realistic because if we're going to shoot uh, in April, we should probably have the money by April. <laughs> right. So, so uh, we set uh, April 1st, April Fool's Day, as the day that if we don't have our money in by that day, we would have to tell everybody that we're pushing the dates and we didn't know when. It would be indefinite. Like we we would make it, but we, we until we got all the money, like we would just forego those dates. Mm. I cried so hard when I was like, had that realization of like, okay, I could, it's very possible that this is not going to work out. Cause it was, this was like, she was very kind and waited till like the second to last week of March to tell me this. And, and I was like, cause you know, she didn't want to kill my spirits, but I was like, all right, I have like a week and a half. Nobody said yes yet. Let's just give it everything and see what happens. And so I pitched my little butt off and I kid you not, the world works in weird ways. On April 1st, all the money came in at once. Uh, yeah, really wow. fucked up. I was like, universe, you know what? Like, that was not really nice. Like, maybe <laughs> give it to me, like, a little bit here at a time so that I'm not, like, stressed to the last moment. <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I know I said April 1st, but, like, why did you put all of it on April 1st? Yeah. It was so, Ursula. She got you the money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. And so what had happened was a lot of the people that I pitched to, even though they hadn't then said yes, they were just taking their time mulling over it. And so what because they knew that I had a deadline, that was when they told me was on April 1st, like, hey, like 
after thinking it over, like we're going to do it. And so, um, so I raised all the money, uh, which for those out there want to know, um, 225 K, which on a grand scheme of things compared to all the films in the world is quite small. Mm -hmm. Um, but to me, it was the largest amount of money I'd ever gotten to work with in my entire life. And I was so grateful. Um, I remember when the last investor, which is what tipped us over, um, a good friend of mine actually was like, Hey, you get to make your movie, you're greenlit. I just cried and cried. I did all crying <laughs> in one day. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. I, but I raised at this point, I raised to the minimum to green light. So it wasn't the full 225. My green light amount was 150. So at that point, I had raised 150. So Still. It was at that point. Wow. Um, yeah, it was, it was that, that was, that period of time was the most stressful time I've had. Um, my body was showing that like I was losing hair. I um, was very concerned. <laughs> uh, I was like, oh shit, I'm gonna go bald. Uh, like I was losing so much hair. Uh, it was I was just it. stressed out of my F and mine. And uh I couldn't believe. And then of course, you know, once you're greenlit, we're like, Oh fuck, we're greenlit. Oh, Oh God, we're going to shoot in like three weeks. Like we got, we got to get everything like rolling now. So, so it was more stress, but good stress at that point. Um, right. but, uh, yeah. And so we did a week on site. Um, it was the week of April 28th. Uh, because I know because it was my, that's my birthday. Um, so that was another great thing. I got to do prep on my birthday for my f first investor funded film, you know, and celebrate my birthday on set. Like that was the best birthday I could ask for. Hmm. And uh, we did a week of on-site prep, which meant like um, most of the heads of the departments came and they came out of like the generosity of their hearts. Basically I'm, I'm, so I'm, glad that they are mostly all still my friends because i put them through hell let's just say that um this set is not something that most people could get through it was extremely difficult and the reason we could finish it is because i picked people who i knew had my back because they'd had my back since day one and would do the best that they could do for me because because we were friends you know we are friends and uh and so they came like to do prep and they've been prepping. That's the thing. Like that's unheard of. Like usually when I'm, um, if I, if somebody asks me to do a gig for, as an AD, I don't start any work until I see the money and I see the right. contract and everything. They've been prepping prior to any of that. So the reason we were able to shoot this in 11 days, um, only 11 days and have one week of onsite prep. And then I think two pickup days is because we'd been actually prepping since January. Um, I, I mean, it wasn't like full day prepping. It would be like, Oh, prep on the weekend when I have time prep, you know, um, make, make the props here and there slowly and stuff like that. But, and I was like basically out of my pocket paying for materials and stuff to, start the work process you know and so i owe these people so much um they just they believed in the pro they believed in me that was the biggest thish thing this is the number one place for macabre cults classics and horrors for synopsis reviews and news go to macabre.com thank you for listening signing out until the next one